Hey everybody, we are up to topic 7.11 in our study of period 7 in the push curriculum. And today we're going to move away from the Great Depression a little bit and talk about interwar foreign policy. In other words, how is America interacting with the world between the wars? And of course, the big story is getting America ever closer to the war itself, right? World War II I'm referring to. So we're going to look at the 1930s and early 1940s and see how America emerged from its period of isolationism. And if isolation, isolationism is not a term you're familiar with, it's basically um, when America kind of looks inward and doesn't really want to interact that much with the outside world, generally for fear of getting dragged into a war. Uh, we go through periods of this in American history, and certainly after World War I, there was a, um, a very strong sense of isolationism across the country. The second term you may not be familiar with is disarmament, and disarmament means basically trying to reduce the size of militaries around the world, the theory being if militaries aren't large, then there's less likelihood of a war. And that brings us to our first topic, guys. It's called the Washington Naval Conference, and it took place in 1921 through 1922. All the great powers sent delegates to talk about how to limit the size of navies. Because, you know, this is a time period before nuclear weapons and long-range aircraft. And so, really, the navy, uh, particularly battleships, were seen as like the ultimate weapon. And so, this is an attempt to try to cut down on the number of large ships that countries have. Again, in an attempt to prevent a war. Now, what comes out of this is known as the Five Power Naval Treaty of 1922. And this treaty is going to uh, impose a 10-year holiday on battleship construction. That means for 10 years, the countries who agree to this will not build any more battleships. Uh, to, to kind of um, live within the quota that they have, uh, some ships will be scrapped altogether to try to get these countries within this ratio here of 553. Now, the 553 ratio refers, you can see here, to battleship tonnage. So about 500,000, 500,000, 300,000, and I guess we're going to round up all the way to three uh, with France and Italy. So it's not about the number of battleships, it's about the tonnage of those battleships. You can also see aircraft carriers um, kind of in that same um, vein here of being limited by that same ratio, basically. Now, if you look at the numbers, I mean, clearly, um, I think we can all agree Japan, France, and Italy are going to feel left out. And it's also interesting that Japan ranks higher than France uh, in Italy because it really shows us that Japan is on the rise. It's on the ascendancy as a world power that they are allowed to have more battleships than France or Italy. All right, now let's talk about trying to ban war altogether. It's known as the Kellogg-Briand Pact. The name comes not from a serial, but from Frank Kellogg, our Secretary of State under Calvin Coolidge in the late 1920s. And basically, if countries sign up to this agreement, they are signing uh, to, to pledge to end war. In other words, they'll only fight a defensive war. They'll never go on the offensive. And it seems kind of, in retrospect, very naive, the idea that we're going to ban war. Uh, but they thought maybe this is possible. Maybe we'd learn from the experience of World War I. There's a lot of problems with this, however. There's no means of enforcement. Um, and as, as wars do start to creep up on the horizon, this thing just kind of collapses like a house of cards. And you can see here in the political cartoon, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, basically blowing up in the world's face here in 1939. I mentioned the Kellogg part was from the American, uh, uh, American Secretary of State, Frank Kellogg. Um, his counterpart was Aristide Briand of France. That's the Briand part. All right, let's go to um, kind of branch out a little bit from America for a moment and look at our neighbors. And we're going to focus on FDR's so-called good neighbor policy. And that sort of implies that we were not a good neighbor uh, before this. And if you think back, America had certainly intervened a lot in Latin America. We've gotten a reputation of a country that kind of comes in Think of the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, for example. Uh, again, we, we, we're kind of this country who, when we feel necessary, we intervene in various countries. And that honestly earned us a lot of bad reputation and bad blood from Latin America. So going forward, with the good neighbor policy, FDR says we're not, not going to do that anymore. 
We're not going to invade and intervene in these countries' affairs. And he's doing this less out of a sense of fair play and, and that kind of stuff. It's more, though, he wants these countries in Latin America um, not starting to maybe look at Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union or something uh, with, with fondness. They want those countries to be on our side in any potential war in the Western Hemisphere. So here are political cartoons. You can see FDR there gardening with uh, the Mexican leader. And uh, there's the good neighbor, good neighbor policy. Now, let's think, let's think about Europe in the 1920s and 30s. And as you know, there are a series of dictators on the rise. Um, these men really don't need any introduction because you've learned plenty about them in the past. Uh, Stalin, Mussolini, and Hitler would be, of course, the, the big three of evil dictators in Europe at the time. You can see some, some imagery here of um, Stalin, or excuse me, Hitler rather, not Stalin, Hitler and uh, his Japanese and, Mus and his Italian counterparts here all kind of joining together. Uh, it's nice propaganda for us. Now, let's talk about some aggression. So in 1935, Italy uh, gets its revenge on Ethiopia because back in the late 1800s, if you might remember this from world history, uh, Ethiopia had, had tried to modernize itself and was able to defend itself against an Italian invasion and maintain its independence, something it was very proud of. But Mussolini had promised his people, the people of Italy, a new Roman Empire, and Ethiopia seemed to be easy pickings, and it kind of was. They're going to invade in 1935 using tanks, airplanes, poison gas, machine guns, uh, and just really do a number on the Ethiopians. Now, if you think about it, the League of Nations was designed to prevent this very type of aggression, the, the unwarranted uh, aggression of countries who just want to attack because they want to, right? They're, there's no, they're not defending themselves, they're just invading because they want to conquer it. So back in America, how much interest is there in taking an active role in, in confronting these aggressors? And the answer is pretty much none. Right? We decide, hey, we've got big oceans on either side of us. We don't need to get involved. No country is going to invade us anytime soon. Plus, we've got the Great Depression we're fighting. The last thing we need to do is worry about foreign problems as well. So Americans really retreat further and further into isolationism. And our political cartoon here <clears throat> by Dr. Seuss is sort of implying that we're ignoring the real problems here. We're burying our heads in the sand and hoping that the problems will simply go away and solve themselves. All right, now we're going to look at the so-called neutrality acts. And this is a series of laws that were passed in 35, 36, and 37. And we don't need to get too into the details of these individual laws, but collectively they were designed by Congress to prevent Americans from getting involved in a foreign war. For example, uh, going forward, uh, Americans were not allowed to sail on ships that belong to countries involved in war. This is obviously a reference back to the Lusitania sinking in 1915. We don't want another event like that getting us dragged into a war. Uh, also, we weren't able to sell weapons or loan money to countries involved in wars. Again, the theory is if we just completely stay out of things, there's no real danger we'll get dragged into a war against our will. All right, now let's look at appeasement, something I know you learned about in world history, because if you were in my class, I definitely taught you about it. And appeasement was simply this idea of giving into aggressors to maintain the peace. Uh, you give into the bully so he doesn't beat you up, basically. And in 1937, um, FDR tries to push back against appeasement a little bit. He gives what's known as the quarantine speech. He gives this in Chicago in 1937, and he says that the countries of the world must, in his words, use positive endeavors to, quote, quarantine aggressors. Well, I think we all know what quarantine that means nowadays. And the fact that he's He's actually calling on countries to do something active against aggressors means, for some people, that sounds like a call for war. And there was a big backlash against this, and FDR kind of backpedals and says, oh, well, wait a minute, I, I didn't really mean we're going to go to war or anything. I was just saying we should probably do something, but maybe not us and maybe somebody else, and who knows what that is. Let's go back to not talking about war. <laughs> it becomes a politically toxic topic, and he doesn't want anything to do with it. 
So uh, that's what this cartoon is sort of implying that uh, FDR had sort of tested the waters a little bit about being a little bit more active, and he was told by the people, uh, "No, we're not. We're not interested." Meanwhile, aggression was marching across Europe in 1938, as you might remember from world history. Hitler unifies his home country of Austria with Germany. It's known as the Anschluss, which means annexation in German. And he also remilitarized this area of west in the western part of Germany, uh, right with his border with France. And nobody stopped him. Okay, FDR didn't. Germany uh, was basically able to kind of do whatever it wants. Britain and France are also kind of just like, eh, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, that Hitler guy, what's, I mean, what do you expect? But they don't take any real serious steps to stop him. And then in 1938, at the so-called Munich Conference, and Munich, by the way, is a big city in southern Germany, the second biggest in Germany. At this conference, the Allies once again cave in to Hitler, and dramatically so. They give him an area known as the Sudetenland. And the Sudetenland was a part of Czechoslovakia that was German-speaking. And, and this is really kind of a connection back to the older history of this area. You might remember Austria-Hungary, this great empire through here, and it was controlled by Austrians who were German speakers. Well, as a legacy of that failed empire, there are a lot of German speakers who live right through here. And Hitler says, well, I've got to have these people in my country. So uh, I demand this land because I'm trying to unify all the German speakers of the world into one great fatherland. And the Allies basically say, well, okay, I, I guess you can have it as long as this is it. No more demands, Hitler. And Hitler says, well, of course. And then in 1939, he takes over the rest of Czechoslovakia. So Hitler's taken over Austria and Czechoslovakia without firing any shots. And at this point, it's clear that appeasement just doesn't work. Which is why on September 1st, 1939, when Hitler invades Poland, uh, his excuse was he wanted this land right here to connect the two pieces of Germany. Um, when he invades, France and Britain say, that's it, wartime, and World War II begins. Which, going back to America, means we've got a whole different uh, set of problems, right? It's one thing to talk theoretically about a war. It's another to react to an ongoing war, especially one that seems to be going so well for the bad guys and so poorly for the good guys. So this brings us to a new Neutrality Act, which takes place in 1939. And going forward, uh, we are going to, Congress is going to let Americans um, sell weapons of war to European countries on a cash and carry basis. So in other words, we're not going to loan any money, but as long as they bring the money, the cash money, right to us, and they take it on their own shifts there and back, um, they can buy tanks, airplanes, machine guns, whatever they want. This will help uh, these allies out. It will also help us put people back to work. So we're, we're seeing the, uh, the Great Depression starting to really fade out by 39 and 1940. Speaking of 1940, in the spring of 1940, Hitler does something dramatic. Um, he conquers France, and this shocked Americans to the core because France had held out against German attacks uh, for four years in World War I, and this time they last only six weeks against Germany. And this leaves only Britain as kind of a strong country standing in the way of Hitler. And all of a sudden, we're taking this war a lot more seriously because we come to the conclusion that we have to preserve Britain because to preserve Britain is to preserve us, right? They're kind of like um, our lifeline, our, the speed bump in the way of uh, Hitler's aggression. We've got to defend them so that we're not then conquered by the Nazis. So Congress uh, changes things pretty dramatically. They agree to... Uh, spend a lot of money, $37 billion, to build up the military. You know, this includes a lot of battleships, and airplanes, and such. In 1940, they also agreed to um, conduct our very first ever peacetime draft. We'd have drafts before, but they'd always been wartime. This time, peacetime. This brings us to something called the America First Committee. This was a group of hardcore isolationists who were dead set on avoiding a potential war at all costs. They're basically saying, let's, th let's focus on us, not those other countries over there. Why are we you know, helping other countries when we still have so many problems here on our own? So America first, that's their, their slogan. 
And they have a very uh, persuasive speaker and a celebrity uh, that is Charles Lindbergh, the guy who made history in 1927 by crossing the Atlantic in an airplane, right? The first transatlantic uh, solo flight in ever in history. All right, now let's do some lend lease. So you might remember that we had changed 1939 to this cash and carry basis. That meant that we would sell weapons of war to countries as long as they're willing to pay for it up front in cash and take it on their ships. But by the later part of 1940, Britain is really stretched extremely thin and they just they don't have the money and they don't have the ships necessary to sustain themselves any longer. So FDR uh, is going to put pressure on Congress to change things a little bit to where we will lend and lease equipment uh, to Britain and any other country we see as sort of, um, you know, opposing aggression and necessary for our survival. Um, his analogy was that if your neighbor's house catches on fire and he comes rushing over to your house uh, to borrow a hose to put out the fire, you don't sell him a hose, right? Uh, you, you let him borrow the hose because if he puts out the fire at his house, it won't spread to your house and you'll be safe for in the end. And this lend lease bill eventually passes and FDR said that this will allow America to become the arsenal of democracy. The arsenal of democracy, right? We're going to give the weapons of war to these countries who desperately need it to defeat fascism and aggression. And by the end of the war, we had given away very generously some $50 billion worth of tanks, airplanes, guns, bullets, you name it. Um, in terms of inflation, that's over half a trillion dollars in modern dollars. Okay. And once again, just to reiterate, this is going to help us kind of gear up for the war and put Americans back to work. All right. So Hitler's got his U-boats, his submarines out and about, and they begin attacking American ships. And I think we know why, because American ships are now carrying stuff that are being used to help the enemies of Hitler, right? So Hitler cries foul. He's like, hey, America, if you're neutral, why are you helping out my enemy? That's not very neutral. And so they start attacking ships, and Americans start to find themselves in the sights of, Jap or, excuse me, of, of German submarines. On October 31st, 1941, uh, the USS Reuben James, you can see the, the ship here, uh, um, a destroyer, was sunk by a German U-boat, killing over 100 sailors. So Americans are now dying in a war that we're not even technically in. By mid-November 1941, our merchant ships are allowed to put guns on them to defend themselves against German submarines. So things are getting so tense that everyone is convinced that when this war starts for America, it's going to begin against Germany. It's going to involve something to do with submarines in the Atlantic. What we don't realize, of course, is, well, Japan's got other problems. They've got other uh, plans. So Japan, if you know anything about their geography, they tend to be, they are a very resource poor country. They don't have a lot of iron, oil, that kind of stuff, the stuff they need to have an industrial economy. This is what pushed Japan to build their empires, to get ha their hands on more and more of those raw materials. But, they, again, they have the Achilles heel of not having enough in their own country. There's virtually no oil deposits, for example, in Japan. So when Japan invades French Indochina in 1940, uh, America is furious about this. And so we basically cut them off. Uh, we're going to say, yeah, you're dependent on our stuff, right? Our scrap metal, our steel, our oil. Well, we'll just, we'll just cut you off, Japan, to, to encourage you not to be so aggressive in Asia. And so in mid-1941, we stopped selling oil to Japan, which from, from the Japanese perspective, this was seen as basically a declaration of war. Uh, because this would prevent them from continuing to have an empire, and therefore America is trying to undo their progress from their perspective. They feel backed into a corner, and I think we all know what's going to happen next. The Japanese begin planning their strike. Now, we had broken a lot of Japanese military codes, so we knew an attack was likely. We just didn't know when. We just didn't know where. And when it hits, we're frankly rather surprised. We expected it to happen maybe in the Philippines, um, you know, somewhere else, maybe Guam or something like that in the, in the distant Pacific. But it's going to happen at Pearl Harbor instead. 
And the goal for Japan at Pearl Harbor was to hit us with this surprise attack using their aircraft carriers uh, and just sink as many of our battleships as possible. It takes a long time, guys, to build and repair battleships. So the thought was they can wipe them out all out in one big strike that it'll be such a setback for America, it will take us months, if not years, to recover. And in that time, Japan can expand their empire out and begin fortifying it, and then America would have to fight their way through it. And Japan expects America is not willing to do that, and we'll just kind of be like, well, I guess you can have all that territory, Japan. We learned our lesson. Guess we didn't, huh? Anyhow, so this attack results in about 2,400 American deaths, most of them uh, military, but there were some civilians killed as well. This is the fleet of Japan heading out to Hawaii. Okay, and there's Hawaii right there. They're going to launch their aircraft carriers, strike Oahu, and then come back. And then the ships are going to sail back to Japan. There's a close-in view of the two waves of attacks. There's Pearl Harbor. And, of course, our battleships were all lined up nice and neat in what's known as Battleship Row. Uh, this is Ford Island right here. And our battleships were here just sitting ducks uh, for the Japanese. And you can see all the different ships right here, also some over there. And uh, this is a picture actually taken from a Japanese aircraft during the attack. And uh, just damage. And I mentioned about 2,400 Americans died in this attack. Almost half of those all came from one specific ship, the USS Arizona. Uh, this is a still from a... Uh, a newsreel of it going up. Basically what happened was its magazine, which is where all the ammunition is stored and gunpowder and everything, uh, it caught on fire and it just went up in one gigantic catastrophic explosion, killing um, almost 1,200 of the 1,400 sailors on board. And if you've ever been to Pearl Harbor, you may have seen the USS Arizona. There's a memorial there today. Um, the, it, the ship itself still is on the floor there of the harbor. And this memorial uh, kind of basically uh, straddles the ship there, and all the names of the sailors are, are on there. It's a very somber place. Um, and even after all these years, oil from the tanks of the Arizona still bubbles to the surface. People refer to them as the tears of the Arizona. And so now America is in full-fledged, let's get revenge mode, right? How dare Japan do this? This was a shocking Shocking moment. Nothing like this has really happened in American history. I mean, I guess maybe you could think back to the sinking of the USS Maine, but the numbers were much lower, and frankly, it turns out that the Spanish didn't even attack the USS Maine, probably. This one is just so much more in your face, right? The Japanese, we can't just let this pass. And so the very next day, Congress declares war on Japan. Uh, by the way, the, the uh, declaration of war was not unanimous. There was one person who voted against it. Her name was Jeanette Rankin, and she was a hardcore pacifist, and she refused, even after Pearl Harbor, to, um, to vote for a declaration of war. So just a couple days later, G Germany and Italy declare war on us. So now we are at war with all the big Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. And we are now fully into World War II. So we've covered a lot of ground, guys, in this video. But we basically went from us, you know, hey, let's let's ban war. Let's, let's decrease our military. Hey, I wonder if we can just ignore the rest of the world and survive. To, gosh, we better get involved in, the, in what's going on in the world. To, okay, now we're in this war. <laughs> I mean, we, we've gone a long way in the course of about 10 years. In the next, next videos, we will get into World War II proper and talk about the military stuff, the civilian stuff, how it changes the home front, all that good stuff, guys, in our coming videos.